<clears throat> well, how are you doing? <clears throat> this is going to be a, a small video, um, quick video on the speed of light. Um, just some stuff about it and a question. <clears throat> because I've been having a lot of um, uh, online debate uh, in comments uh, with people on our opposing side who are claiming that the two-way speed of light was measured and I'm pointing out that it was never measured. The one-way speed of light was never measured. You can't know the two-way speed without a one-way speed. It's like if you drive your car for one hour and you drive it somewhere and then drive it back and it takes you an hour to do it, but your car has no speedometer in it, who can know how fast you drove to the place and return? You might have drove 20 miles an hour going there and 120 miles an hour coming back or vice versa you know so it's like the problem is is that our opposition need light right so, sorry need the speed of light which is c in einstein's relativity um and his uh e equals mc squared um uh, um equation they they need they need it to be a constant because they need to um, they need to have parallel light rays. And that means they need the speed of light, the two-way speed of light, to be correct. So for the distances and sizes of all these celestial objects that they claim uh, within the heliocentric uh, model, so <clears throat> they have they need this two-way speed of light to be a constant. They need uh the the calculation to be a measurement even though it's only a calculation um it, if anyone wants to look at into it uh <clears throat> ole Ro romer he was the first to calculate it and he had to pre-assume the earth was a globe of a particular size he had to pre-assume that kepler's analema was correct and that there he had to use an average him and other people like him had to use the average um, radius of a globe out and they had to use the average distance of a, between the globe out and its heliocentric sun over a 12 month period that's two averages besides all the other pre-assumptions that's two averages averages are not measurements they're calculations you can't have two averages be a measurement they're only ever going to be a calculation so you have to make a load of pre-assumptions and use averages um, to do what he did, which was, uh, which was um, n um, uh, the eclipse of Jupiter, I think it was. I can't remember exactly what it was, but <clears throat> basically, he needed to use the Earth and its uh, orbit, or the globe Earth and its orbit of the heliocentric sun, and he needed to use uh, angles and uh, the radio and different things. But the whole thing is only based on calculation. There's, and pre heliocentric pre-assumption. So there is nothing. There's no there's no validity to anything. There's no measurement at all of light and this, uh, of having any speed, whether it be a constant speed or semi-constant or whatever, right? <clears throat> now, I'm going to read out some stuff here. And uh, I'm going to be asking a question after I've done this bit of reading. Now, this is not... I'm not putting this forward... So I don't want, want any straw man uh, arguments in the comments. I'm not stating that Einstein's relativity was anything. I'm just going to read this out as it, it, I needed to make the point. So <clears throat> this is from this, this is from two, uh, 2021. I'll, I'll link these articles I'm going to show in the, uh, in the description. So it's from Universe Today. <clears throat> There's no way to measure the speed of light in a single direction. Special relativ relativity is one of the most strongly validated theories humanity has ever devised. It is central to everything from space travel and GPS to our electrical power grid. Central uh, to relativity is the fact that the speed of light in a vacuum is an absolute constant. The problem is that fact has never been proven. When Einstein pro proposed the theory of relativity, it was to explain why light always had the same speed. In the late 1800s, it was thought that since light travels uh, as a wave, it must be carried by some kind of visible, sorry, invisible material known as the luminif, luminif, luminiferous ether. The reasoning 
was that waves require a medium, such as sound in air or water waves in water. But if the ether exists, then the observed speed of light must change as the earth moves uh, through the ether. But measurements uh, to observe ether drift came up null. The speed of light appeared to be constant. Yeah, and light is, is described as not as a wave. It does, or it's not described that way. Um, it, like it, within the likes of the uh, double slit experiment, and that it's not. It's a photon. Okay, sorry. Where are we? So Einstein found that the problem was in assuming that space and time were absolute and the speed of light could vary. If instead he you assumed the speed of light was absolute, space and time would be affected by relative motion. It's a radical idea, but it's supported by every measurement of light's constant speed. That's the problem, the constant speed claim. But several physicists, uh, physicists, sorry, <coughs> I can never say that word, have pointed out that while relativity assumes the vacuum, vacuum speed of light is a universal constant, it also shows that the speed can never be measured. Specifically, relativity forbids you from measuring the time it takes light to travel from point A to point B. To, me to measure the speed of light in one direction, you'd need a synchronized stopwatch at each end, but relative motion affects the rate of your clocks relative to the speed of light. You can't synchro excuse me, synchronize them without knowing the speed of light, which you can't know without measuring. So what you can do is use a single stopwatch to measure the round trip time from A to B back to A. And this is what every measurement of the speed of light does. But that's not a measurement, is it? It's a calculation. Since all the, and a pre-assumption, since all the round trip speed of light measurements give a constant result, you might figure uh, you might figure you can just divide the time by two and call it a day. That is exactly what Einstein did. He assumed the time there and back was the same. Our experiments agree with that assumption, but they also agree with the idea that the speed of light coming towards us is 10 times faster than the speed going away from us. Light doesn't have to have a constant speed in all directions. It just has to have an, a constant average. Round trip speed. Relativity still, hold, uh, still holds if the speed of light is an anisotropic. Sorry, wait for there. So, <clears throat> If the speed of light varies with its direction of motion, then we would see the universe in a different way. When we look at distant galaxies, we are looking back in time because light takes time to reach us. If distant light reaches us quickly in some direction, we would see the universe in that direction as older and more expanded. The faster light reaches us, the less back in time we would see. Since we observe a uniform cosmos in all directions, surely that, sh that shows the speed of light is constant. Right? <clears throat> see, you have to, just before I go on, the heliocentric model, due to Einstein's relativity, they have to add in uh, time as a re as something that's real. They have to add it in as in we're looking back in time or forward in time, depending on what direction we're looking in this claimed universe place, which is just the stars in the sky. This big universe place, it's just the stars in the sky. You know, that's all it is. But they have to make more of it than, than what it is because they don't know what it is. So they have to talk about looking back in time and forward in time. Time is a concept. It's not real. Time is not real. Okay. <clears throat> well, not quite. As a new study shows, it turns out that if the speed of light varies with direction, so does length contraction and time dilation. The team considered uh, the effects of anisotropic light on a simple re relativistic model known as the, the Moylan uh, universe, M I L N E universe. It's basically a toy universe, similar in structure to the uh, to the observed, but without all the matter and energy. They found that the anisot anisot anisotropic uh, uh, of light would cause anisotropic relativity effects in same in time relation and cosmic expansion. These effects would cancel out the observable effects of a varying light speed. In other words, even if the universe was anisotropic due to a varied speed of light, it would still appear ho homogeneous. So it seems simple cosmology isn't able to prove Einstein's assumption about the speed of light either. Sometimes the most basic ideas in science are the most difficult to prove. Yeah, it's going to be very difficult to prove a constant speed of light when you haven't measured it at all. That's going to make things very difficult. Surely, because you'd have to measure it in the first place. Nobody measured any of this. As Veritasian points out here in his video, it's impossible. Right, I'll be linking this 
uh, this and my next and the next article in the description so you can watch Veritas in this video. It's impossible. No, nobody has ever measured this. It can't be done. Not that we know of, or it hasn't been so far. So this is this is from New Scientist, right? It's going to go up. This is from where we are, uh, New Scientist. Cosmic uncertainty in the speed of light really. Uh, uh, sorry, cosmic uncertainty is the speed of light really constant, right? I just want to go down rather than read down through all of it. Just one part here. Then again, if the speed of light were infinite, massless particles and the information they carry would move from A to B instantaneously. Uh, cause would sit on top of effect and everything would happen at once. The universe would have no history and no future and time as we understand it would disappear. We wouldn't like the universe like that. This is what they say. How do you know we wouldn't like it? Maybe that says what it is, this universe thing you talk about. You know, there's it, a lot of pre-assumptions being made here, heliocentric pre-assumptions. What this is saying is that if light is not a constant, then, oh no, everything changes. Do you know what I mean? It's like if light or if light is light has a sorry if light has an infinite uh, like a speed of light was infinite, then you know a lot of things would change within the heliocentric model and what they believe about the universe. Loads of things would change. You know if it if it had if it didn't have a finite speed. You know it is uh, it, it means that the, oh, oh, there's so much of the heliocentric model that's built on this on this theory that light is a constant. This C in uh, in Einstein's uh, relativity, you know, uh, and now I don't like his E equals M C squared. Uh, I don't agree with the equation um, because it involves certain things like this constant two way speed of light and mass, which is uh, which is a lot of nonsense. But I, when it comes to E equals M C squared, I do believe there's something in that. You know, I do believe there's something in that. That to do with uh, matter and energy, and energy, I do believe that there is something in that. Now, have I proven it? No, but I know this much: I can burn a log, and when I burn that log uh, on a fire, that becomes ashes. Only a small portion of what it was physically, only a small portion of what it was. The rest became heat, energy. You know, and as we know from the first law of thermodynamics, neither energy nor matter. Uh, sorry, neither, neither uh, energy nor matter can be created or, de or destroyed. So it's so cyclic, you know, or cyclic, whichever way you want to pronounce it. It's cyclic. So there is something in that. So I'm not stating that Einstein was wrong about absolutely everything. But when it comes to his relativity, he was really pushing his luck. Uh, but it, but I, I think a lot, a lot of it is down to Einstein himself um, having a big imagination. As he did say, it, he did state that imagination is the greatest uh, sign of intelligence, or something, something along those lines. <clears throat> but he also stated that the two-way speed of light uh, calculation is just an agreed-upon convention, and you can see that in Veritasium's video uh, here, where where that quote is left in there. <clears throat> so, on to my question, right? This is. Uh, a ring laser gyro. This is a basic offer, right? There is two uh, beams from this, right? This is a, a beam going this way and it'll go uh, clockwise and another beam going that way will go anti-clockwise, right? Now, <clears throat> I just want to go in here. This is from Aerospace, uh, Honeywell Aerospace, right? They are known for making uh, ring laser gyros. I just want to read just this part here. <clears throat> When a ring laser gyro is in motion, the beams of light travel different distances. The difference in frequency is proportional to the rotation rate. The frequency difference is measured via an interfer interference, sorry, interference fringe pattern whose phasing contains the directional information. Right. So I want to read that one more time. When a ring laser gyro is in motion, the beams of light travel different distances. Right. The difference in frequency Right, there's a difference in frequency is proportional to the rotation rate. The frequency difference is measured via an interference fringe pattern whose phasing contains the directional information. So if I just come back here again. So these beams, right, right, uh, are moving. I just want to go back, just get that words. Right. <clears throat> uh, the beams that I travel different distances, right? So both these beams are not traveling at the same 
to the same at the same distance. They're not traveling the same distance. One is traveling one distance, the other one is traveling another distance, right? And that causes a change in frequency, right? Here it shows right uh, clockwise beam and counterclockwise beam, and it's kind of showing a diagram of uh, frequency change here for clockwise rotation, uh, clockwise beam, counterclockwise beam, and it's showing it here. So. <clears throat> If they're noticing a change in uh, frequency with the ring laser gyro, right? If they're showing noticing a change in frequency and that's how it's working with the ring laser gyro as one beam has to travel further than the other, uh, from what Honeywell are saying, right? Uh, when a ring laser gyro is in motion, the beams of light travel different distances. The difference in frequency is proportional to the rotation rate. The frequency difference is measured via an interference fringe pattern whose phasing contains the directional information. So, if like if they're if it's like if it's coming from the same unit, the lasers, um, but there's a frequency difference, then that has to affect this claim that light is a constant um it doesn't like how does this affect the claim that light is a constant because if there's a frequency difference right that is detectable um then how can light be a constant because one one beam is traveling a different distance than the other there's a frequency difference according to what they're saying maybe i'm misunderstanding what they're saying but from what i could find out about it that seems to be correct there is a frequency difference so and these are lasers and a ring laser gyroscopes in la ring laser gyroscopes so <clears throat> uh, and as far as i know they're vacuumed units um so it would be lasers working lasers are light within a vacuum so um you know are, are they like these this frequency change that they're speaking about this is due to the different dis different distances, so that would make it not a constant, wouldn't it? It would change it because the frequency changes. That would make it not a constant. You know, if we look at it that way, and if we also bring the inverse square law into it, how does light keep the same frequency and also diverge in all directions? How does that happen? You know, there's a bit of a problem there. Like Einstein, o, Einstein C, um, I mean that is based on its origins is based on a load of pre-assumptions, and it's based on two averages. And Einstein just himself, he uh, Einstein himself said it's just a convention that, that that's agreed upon. So there is no measurement of a two-way speed of light. There's no proof that it's a constant. Um. There's no proof it's finite or infinite. Um, but here it's showing that there is, from what I can see, that there is a frequency change due to two different distances traveled. So correct me if I'm wrong, but ring laser gyros, as far as I know, they are vacuumed units. And uh, sorry, they are vacuumed units. And if the lasers are traveling in two different directions and there is a, a, a frequency change due to that, because the uh, the source of laser output is the same, the source is the same, but there's a frequency change, then how does that affect things? Maybe I'm asking, maybe my questions don't mean anything. I don't know. But something is, just these things are not adding up. I know the two-way speed of light was never measured. That I know for definite. So to claim that light is a constant, um, how can how can this happen? You know, if I'm understanding this correctly, how can the uh, frequencies change? Because that's what Honeywell are saying. One more time, when a ring laser gyro is in motion, the beams of light travel different distances. The difference in frequency is proportional to the rotation rate. The frequency difference is measured via an interference fringe pattern whose phasing contains the direction of information. So. How can there be a difference in frequency when uh, it's coming from the same source? The only difference is that one is that in one direction the beam is traveling a slightly further. I'll leave it at that. See what you say about it. Thank you.